and I think this is cool. So yeah, I'm going to be speaking about the framework which I've been building that we've heard a decent amount now through the episode from, from the earlier talk. And it's really this capacity estimation framework, which forms one of the core pieces of infrastructure, both in terms of our assessment and optimization pipeline. So the real goal was to try and build an automated, scalable framework which could rapidly estimate large data sets of physical properties. So in particular, we wanted a tool that could interface with some of the large open data sources, things like NetSQL and Analytics or the binding database, something that could go automatically extract the data from these sources, filter it, curate it, and really put it into objects which we can easily manipulate and, and kind of consume. More than just having a tool that can extract the data, we wanted it to almost be able to understand the data, kind of know what is a density, know what is a, a solvation for energy, or at least automatically know what calculation steps would be required to estimate these different properties. Or if the framework doesn't know how to estimate these different physical properties, we want everything to be extensible so that anyone can come and plug in their own definition of how should any physical property be able to be estimated that they think may help in the optimization or assessment cycle. Kind of not just defining or knowing how to estimate these physical properties just by using or roaming simulations. We actually want to go a bit further than that. So if we're using kind of a, a, a gradient-based optimization engine to do our force field picking, we maybe do 10, 20 iterations, 10, 20 evaluations of the objective function. But what we're looking to do in the future is move to more sophisticated techniques kind of Monte Carlo-based sampling and Bayesian picking, and these typically require on the order of hundreds or thousands of, uh, of evaluations of the objective function. So if you're having to do that many, you can't just go and run a, a simulations at every step. You need something a bit more sophisticated. So this framework isn't just about running simulations to get out physical properties, but it's estimating from simulations and simulation data. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. In the same vein of kind of this performance improvement, we also want this framework to be entirely scalable as possible. So in particular, we want to be able to scale up to the size of the data sets that we want to fit against and optimize against and assess against, but also be able to scale up with the availability of compute resources as our demands grow and grow and grow. So maybe spoiler, but this is kind of the framework we've built. Um, and if nothing else, the take home message is we can use this and it works quite well. So just, I, I think it's been mentioned before, but just to, to, to stress again, the point of this framework is twofold really. It's crucial for helping to curate our physical property data sets and curate and, and extract them from the data source. And it's also what we do both in terms of our assessment, kind of a human running this framework, but also in that optimization cycle to kind of integrate into whichever optimization engine we're trying to use. So kind of a nice take of Python API. So I won't say too much about this because I think Michael Schwartz is going to talk about it and he's heard more about this. But essentially, the first release has been based on trying to optimize and assess against data from this thermal archive, which contains a vast number of thermodynamic properties, hundreds of thousands of densities, tens of thousands of, of mixed properties. Um, so we really wanted, and the first thing that I did was building the framework to build a utility to kind of go into thermal and pull all of this data down. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't talk too much about this, but essentially we've got this Python API this kind of thermomel data set object. So you just give it the digital object identifier of the data set that you want to pull from this thermomel archive, or a list of URLs or a list of file paths. It will go understand this data format, pull over that data into a Python object. You can do some basic filtering, curation, temperature ranges, pressure ranges, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. And this kind of object has been what we use in the first few rounds of fishing to kind of build our data set that we want to optimize against. And for anyone interested in how we pick kind of the data set, the link can't quite be seen, but we use this, this, this object in the NIST, uh, NIST data selection repository, which we have in GitHub, which details how we use this kind of API to build our, to build our automatic data sets. Kind of the key aspect of the framework is actually the, the, the estimation of these physical properties. So with scalability in mind, we kind of chose to design the framework as kind of a, a we call it like a, a client server architecture, so the basic idea is this. So you on your laptop or four talents on your laptop could be able to use our API to kind of pull down the physical property data sets into a Python object. You'd be able to load in the force field of interest. And then what you would do is what we call create a, 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 an object called the property estimated client. So the property estimated client takes the data set, it takes the force field parameters and translates that into a tangible set of calculation steps. Essentially it translates a density into a workflow graph or a set of workflow steps. So uh, built in, 
again, it has a number of definitions for how to trans transfer things like identity into a work progress. But it's at this kind of point where you can plug in your own definition, either if you want to change how internally we're choosing to estimate these properties, but also if you want to expand things to estimate your own properties, you kind of just define it at this step. The idea is that once this client object has turned your property of interest into some kind of workflow graph to execute, it tries to connect to what we call this property estimator server. So the property estimator server is just a, a program that runs on whatever compute resource we've got available. Maybe it's a big CPU supercomputer or maybe a supercomputing cluster, but it just sits and spins on that object and waits for the client, the, the client object to kind of send it those workflow graphs. The server then kind of uses a, a, a library to take those graphs and execute them across compute resources. It does the calculations, it uh, computes the properties as well as their the gradients with respect to force field parameters. But one of the key things the server does, as well as just kind of launching the calculations, is it starts to store all of the data that we're generating from these calculations. In particular, the server object is continuously storing uncorrelated configurations that we generate from any simulations that we're running. And that's kind of the key to what allows us to become more efficient in the future. To give just kind of a, an idea of what this framework looks to use, so in six lines of Python, we can essentially estimate an entire physical property data set containing many different types of properties. So basically, you would load in your data set, you could use our ThermoML data set object, you might do some filtering on it, you would load in your force field parameters, you create this object called the property estimate client, you just say client, you create the data set using these force field parameters, this automatically spins up and connects to the server, the server does its business, returns back the results, and you can query either has the server finished with these using this results object, this kind of request object, or kind of get up to date information of how far along have these calculations succeeded. So very simplistic, very easy to use both on your laptop, or very easy to kind of hop into the optimizations that we have in mind for the for the future of the cycle. So the, the key thing, and I won't talk too much about this, but the key thing to this framework is we want it to be a rapid to rapidly be able to rapidly estimate property data sets. So not just by running simulations, but by kind of taking this multi-fidelity approach to estimating physical properties. So the idea is within this framework, we've got this kind of notion of different calculation layers, where the idea is a calculation layer is just basically some technique to take a physical property data set and turn it into a, a, a set of estimated values, as, long, as well as a constant. So we've got kind of two calculation layers implemented in the framework at the moment. So we've got one kind of calculation layer, which basically just takes a physical property data set and runs some simulations to estimate those physical properties. Uh, we get the gradient help from that as well, and we turn those values. But as I mentioned, we also use this kind of calculation layer to cache the simulation data that we're generating from these different simulations. In addition to this, we have a secondary kind of calculation layer, which uses a technique called simulation weighting. And what we're waiting to essentially allow you to do is take the results of a simulation that we've done in the past and reprocess it to evaluate what would have been the physical properties that you've estimated from that simulation data had you run that simulation using a slightly different set of predictions. So in particular, if you run a simulation at one set of force field parameters, we're waiting to essentially allow you to reevaluate your observable uh, set of force field parameters very close by. And these kind of methodologies that we employ to do this reweighting not only give you a value for the physical property re-evaluated using these force field parameters, but also kind of a constant in how well have it been able to do this and kind of have you gone too far from that initial state where the method begins to break down. So kind of these two increments left, one that does simulations, one that takes the results of those simulations and tries re-weighting. So why do we do this? Simulation is quite slow. It can take 10 minutes to finish, hours, days, depending on the kind of properties that we want to calculate, whether it's free energy, uh, especially things like host defined infinities, which can be quite expensive to compute. Reweighting this technique where you can continue to cache simulation data is literally just a reprocessing step. You look at a set of uncorrelated uh, samples and you reevaluate those, but essentially it's reprocessing. You don't have to rerun another simulation. So it's order of magnitude faster to estimate properties using reweighting compared to doing the initial simulations themselves. And this is really where we start to see performance gains when we start to estimate. Uh, physical properties using parameters close to where we initially generated the simulations, which is exactly the case of what happens during the optimization. Um, so just to mention that while we have kind of only got two of these calculation layers implemented at the moment, we plan to expand this in the future. But just to give a, a, a more detailed picture of how these kind of calculation layers all fit together, it, it, it really is about how fast can our, uh, our server objects do these calculations and to what confidence can the different layers predict a set of properties. So one can imagine that if we've not run 
any simulation of the ball. He's not done any calculations. He's got no cast data. There's not much <coughs> you can do except to go off and run your simulations and get the, the, uh, the uh, evaluate the objective focus in that way. But you then cast that simulation data from those initial simulations onto this. If you imagine that it's some optimization engine that initially requested that these properties be estimated using these four field parameters, and then the optimization engine makes a small perturbation to those four field parameters and asks you to re-evaluate those physical properties, our server object will receive that request, see that it's now got cache data sitting on the disk, <coughs> will automatically know how to load it up, how to deploy this method for reweighting. It will see, has it now enabled to calculate these physical properties with a sufficient confidence using these two four field parameters? at a speed that's an order of magnitude faster than it has to run those simulations. And if the answer is yes, then perfect, you can just return the result back. If not, the server will automatically know when it can use the faster technique and when it needs to fall back and relaunch a new set of simulations to generate a new set of cache simulation data. The idea of being we run a simulation, we see if we can, we wait it. If not, we launch a new set of simulations, the optimization makes another change to the parameters, and the next time, eventually, we'll get into a region of competence where these kind of reweighting techniques can be able to just reweight the data as opposed to launching these simulations. So this is kind of what we've got built in at the moment. We didn't take too much of advantage of this during the release one session due to a number of slight technical difficulties. But one of the things that we do want to look into at the future is not only use simulations, not only use reweighting, but as we start training things like surrogate models or neural networks to take this cache simulation data and start to learn the response of how are our, our objective function, how are our different physical properties changing as we change our four field parameters. So we think when this, this isn't going to help us too much when we kind of start our optimization and we're kind of far from a minima, but as our optimization engine kind of proceeds and the parameters kind of get more stable, um, we think we can train a surrogate model around that point to learn the responses and should be able to be evaluated in seconds. So where simulations may be days, we wait until maybe tens of seconds, surrogate models would be literally seconds or milliseconds. And it's kind of this multi-fidelity approach which will allow us to go from an optimization engine which maybe needs 10, 20 iterations to one that maybe needs hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of iteration cycles. And this is really the core power of this, this framework that we've been building. This idea that you can use multi-fidelity sampling, different calculation layers, each one that tries to use as much data as possible to estimate these physical properties in the fastest way that we can possibly do this. So in terms of how we actually estimate these properties themselves, either by simulation or by reweighting, is within the property estimation framework, we've built, and I really want to stress, a very lightweight workflow engine. The real focus of this framework has been building the set of reusable workflow components, which when chained together can produce quite powerful workflows and can be used to estimate physical properties. So in particular, we've got protocols which will build coordinates in a set of smiles or will Dotting using OE dots will run simulations using minimization or OPMM, uh, even do quite sophisticated things like run uh, free energy calculations using things like Yang for uh, APR host guest binding symmetry calculations using Sapita. But really, the, 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 the main heart of the property estimation framework is we've got these built in components which do individual tasks, which, when combined together, can form larger workloads which will allow us to estimate almost any different physical property without having to kind of do any coding. It's literally just sticking building blocks together. To give a, an idea of what these protocol objects actually look like, it's not just kind of one protocol feeds into another. Um, these these protocol, protocols are really quite simplistic Python objects. I mean, they just look like a Python class that has a number of getter inputs, a number of getter outputs, and a method that says execute. So there's really nothing to them. It's just literally like a, a Python run script that would do some specific task. And the idea being that each of these protocols will have some input, and these inputs can either be set from constant values. So we may have a, a protocol that runs a simulation, and you might want to set the time set, and you might want to set that just arbitrarily to one jump second. But this protocol may also need like a, a topology object to describe what simulation it's going to and what system it's going to run on. So the idea of the input can also come from the output of another protocol, so one of the protocols that maybe builds the system in the first place. So this idea of individual protocols which have a responsibility for doing a small task as part of the property estimation workflow, this idea that you can arbitrarily stick them together either using constants or from the outputs of different protocols is unbelievably flexible and allows us to compute you know, really quite trivially uh, different physical properties just by reusing these same co components. 
just give an example of how we do this again it's piece it's not particularly exciting but we essentially use one of these protocols for building coordinates we use the smirnoff uh, a protocol which can be assigned from smirnoff parameters we have a protocol that does energy minimization a protocol that runs the simulation that just correlates with statistics and use group regression to calculate the average so quite quite vanilla one of the nice things that we have and it's kind of represented by this gray box in this figure, figure is we have built in this notion of what we call a, a conditional execution group which sounds maybe daunting but essentially what it allows us to do is take a group of protocols and just run them again and again and again and again until some specific criteria has been met so in the case of our framework particularly when we estimate our properties we want to calculate things within a certain uncertainty especially kind of roughly on par with the experimental uncertainty with which it's measured so we just take the protocols that we've run the simulation we wrap them in kind of this conditional group and we automatically run them again and again and again until the uncertainty is dispersed within and, and the target uncertainty of our, of our treatment, essentially. And it's not just the simulations we do using these protocols. We also define how you take cash simulation data and use this kind of reweighting technique to reweight these protocols <laughs> using this kind of workflow graph as well. So really quite, quite a flexible system. So the, I, I, I think this may be quite apparent, but the nice thing about defining how we calculate these properties in such a granular nature is that almost any of these steps can be easily taken out and replaced with something else. So for example, maybe we don't want to apply Smirnoff parameters, maybe we want to apply GAP, or maybe we want to apply OPLS 2005. Without changing much of the, type, the definition of how we estimate these different properties, we just take that Smirnoff protocol, we strip out, and replace it with one that applies to Julie instead. Maybe we don't want to use open amendments to run the simulation, we just pull out that block from the workflow and stick in one that runs through much instead. So it's very flexible and modular and it, uh, what it allows you to accomplish, essentially. The other nice thing about it is it allows us to kind of automatically determine where we're doing redundant work. So if you imagine that you're asking for a density to be calculated and a dialectic to be calculated, the steps that one would need to take to actually estimate those different properties are essentially identical from setting up the system, run a simulation and extract the property. It's just the only difference is what property you're extracting. So our framework can automatically look at the workflows that you're using to estimate these different physical properties, see where you're doing redundant calculations and just squish those together so you're doing the least amount of work and so we're not having to run redundant stuff and not using up more compute resources than we need to. So I think one of the, the key things that I want to stress about the, what we're doing with this framework is we're not trying to build a new workflow engine, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel because these things already exist things that we're focusing on is building individual protocol building blocks which are quite generic which can either be used by the very lightweight workflow engine which we've built or which could plug into any available workflow engine which you might like to use as well so instead of writing some really complicated engine which takes our workflow graphs and tries to execute them we just use a library called DAS and basically with DAS you say I've got these protocols I want to execute it then goes off and executes them on your compute resource uh, I won't say too much about that but essentially the, the nice feature of the library we're using, which is called DAS Job View, is it integrates with our local university queuing system and in principle automatically determines how many calculations you're asking for it to do. And integrates with the queuing system, asking you for uh, kind of in, inserting your jobs into the queuing system with, uh, without you having to submit them based on the workload that you're asking it to do. So if you're submitting 40 calculations, this kind of job view library will insert 40 jobs into the cluster. And as those start to finish, it will kind of scale that down. And this, not to go into too much detail, allows us to make real quite powerful use of the cluster and allows us to request more GPUs and more kind of resources than we would otherwise if we were kind of manually submitting these things. So that's a very flyby tour of the property estimator framework. I think as with all our stuff, it's available to download on GIS, GitHub, as well as the, the, the repository which we've been building to actually curate the data sets using the utilities which can be found in the framework itself. But I think, if nothing else, the take home message is that we have this framework. It's incredibly flexible that you can define how you want to estimate your different physical properties just by combining together these, these flexible workflow components. <coughs> what we really wanted to do, and what my personal goal with this framework was, to kind of abstract ourselves away from the simulations themselves and allow us to focus on the scientific questions that we wanted to answer. We wanted to be absolutely trivial for anyone to be able to come along and say, I want to assess my force field against entity of mixing. And without having to rewrite a whole new set of components, we could easily just construct this definition of what is an entity of mixing into the framework. So 
really abstracted ourselves from the nitty-gritty and the tediousness and to take advantage of some of this, this framework. So in terms of what comes next in the framework, we've already reviewed it as part of the optimization cycle, but we're now planning to use it as part of the assessment cycle as well. So as part of that, we want to expand the tools that we've built in to not only extract data, but curate it, filter it, allow us to ask more important, uh, more, more interesting questions, it's not just filtering by kind of temperatures and pressures, but can we build tools which will allow us to filter data set by uh, chemical specificity? Or can we use the uh, build a set of curation tools which will allow us to automatically identify what regions of chemical space is our data set less lacking in essentially, which will allow us to help identify what data are we missing and which blanks do we need to fill in. The other thing that we want to do is continue to expand the number of properties that we have built in support for. So currently the framework can do density, dielectric, density mixing, density for vaporization. It's currently got partial support for host guest, uh, host guest binding affinities, both through absolute finish calculations using blank by using uh, a tactical release sensor based flow tower. And we're just finishing off, uh, implementing that, testing it, and getting ready to uh, use that as part of the assessment phase. And similarly for uh, solid and free energies. So we're almost at the point where we could run these using the framework, but it just needs a little bit more. Uh, implementation and, and testing. Uh, so, in, in addition to that, the, the last two things that um, the things that will really make this powerful going forward and make it more useful for the optimization is this notion of employing surrogate models as one of our additional calculation approaches. Because surrogate models, if we could train a surrogate model on our capital simulation data, it would essentially allow us to evaluate our physical properties really, really rapidly and allow us to do some more sophisticated optimization techniques than what was currently available to us. And of course, additionally, we'd love to improve the ability of the framework to scale across different resources. So currently, it can run calculations on just a single cluster, but we'd love for this to be able to scale across multiple clusters up in six hours, and that's kind of a, another big engineering feat which will allow us to kind of scale up our calculations into the future. Hey. Question, how well how well can you actually fit to all the uh, properties right now? So we can do reasonably well, I think. So currently we've only tried fitting to densities and entities for vaporization. That's what we did in the first round of testing, and that seemed to work reasonably well. Um, so the framework can do the, the properties and the gradients with respect to. In terms of dielectric, that's something that we do want to fit against, but that's a little bit more challenging, just because we find that when you calculate the gradient dielectric function, it's so significantly more noisy. Okay. The other properties. So the, are you trying to actually uh, fit to all of the properties uh, simultaneously? Or do you say fit to one, then try to fit to the next one, and then go back again? And... So typically, we just fit against them all at the same time. So we just throw all of our, for the first round, we throw all of our densities and all of our heat vaporization into the same pot and the same object. Okay. It'd be, it, it'd be interesting to actually see how transferable would it actually be to fit to one property and then see if it improves the, uh, the uh, properties of a different property. I, I think that's absolutely valuable. So I think one of the things that Dave Noble realized was that if we set against dielectric functions, we actually end up improving the hydration for energy. So if we could find those set of properties which are themselves correlated, that would be absolutely fantastic. Absolutely, yeah. But I would say we don't actually know how much better we're doing yet because we haven't done the benchmarking or validation, but that should be happening in the next few, that will be happening in the next few weeks. So then we can make more quantitative things of how well is it doing. And we're just, this is this, this is the testing, or the training, not the testing. Let me demonstrate my ignorance by asking about what, um, the uh, correlation involves in I'm not. the correlation or decoupling. Yeah, yeah, in, in your your workflows. Uh, okay, so we essentially just calculate the autocorrelation function with respect to which is observable with kind of compute, and then we uh, basically subsample based on that autocorrelation time. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks.